welcome back and I'm coming off of the tail end of something so you guys are going to get uh, deep voice radio DJ David here today. Uh, I hope it's not too difficult to understand but today we're talking about PDP 11s and my PDP 11 story is a very strange one to say the least. It all started when I bought a PDP 1183 out of Pittsburgh. My parents so kindly threw it in the back of their SUV and hauled it all the way down here to Texas when coming back from visiting my brother which by the way, my brother has an epic shop in Pittsburgh called Love It Sundry. So if you're ever up in the Pittsburgh area, check out my brother's shop. But also check out Dave McGuire's Large Scale System Museum. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on in Pittsburgh, actually. But once the 1183 was down here, we cracked it open and took a good look at it. There were two BA23 chassis, there was the 1183 CPU card, four megabytes of PMI memory, there was an MFM hard drive, a TK50 tape drive, and a lot of other interesting cards that went along with it. But this just opened the floodgates because very shortly thereafter, a very kind gentleman in Austin named Mike got in touch with me and hooked me up with an amazing collection of PDP 1173 stuff. Turns out Mike worked for a company called Bowman and they did fast Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, I think. Uh, it was all... <laughs> It was all way over my head, but the PDP 1173 was their go-to system. And well, they had long since ago uh, upgraded and Mike was ready to clean out the garage and we got this epic collection of PDP 1173 stuff. And then shortly thereafter, uh, another very kind gentleman down in Houston by the name of Mitch got in touch with me and hooked me up with the mother load of Digital Equipment Corporation stuff. So much stuff I can't list it all here. It, it was unbelievable. There was 1144s and 11730. There was a bunch of uh, VAX stuff. There was a whole lot of Cubus stuff. There was boxes of cards. It was an unbelievable collection. And honestly, it was all way too much for one person to handle. There was more, more systems there than I could restore and get running in a single lifetime. So it didn't make sense for me to hoard all of it to myself. And that's what we've been doing over the past uh, about six months to a year now, is we've been repatriating PDP and VAC systems to the community, trying to get them into the hands of people who may not have ever had a chance to work with a large scale system like the PDP 11. So Mitch and Mike, thank you guys so much. The community is stronger and better and people are getting unbelievable opportunities to work with these systems that may not have ever arisen without your contributions. So thank you guys so much for that. But my PDP 1183 was also on the chopping block. It actually got repatriated to another very kind individual just last week. Uh, so the PDP-1183, we actually did get it up and running and saw that there was a Ristus install on it, but I didn't really know where to go from there. So it made sense to get that into the hands of somebody that would use it like it was supposed to be used. And I think the reason that I was really kind of lost on the 1183 is it's a little new for what I'm interested in. I'm much more so interested in the early 80s, late 70s era of PDP-11. So something like this 1144, is something that I'm very excited about because it's got a massive collection of Unibus cards in it that's just really cool. With the 1144 here, I am kind of in an interesting situation because this 1144 does not transport easily. It barely moves back and forth. And so whenever I go to an event, I don't have any PDP kit with me to show off. <laughs> I've gotten rid of everything. But I did keep essentially three PDPs for myself. I kept this 1144 to stay here in this room. I kept some 1173 stuff so I can maybe get into that fast Fourier transform world uh, in the future. And I kept an, a little 1123 plus. Uh, now, the 1123 Plus, I think, is going to be the perfect candidate to fill this hole of a portable PDP 11 to take to events. But it's in rough shape. So let me pull it out. Uh, we'll put it up on the bench and I'll let you guys take a look at where we are and the mountain that we have to climb. And then we're going to start turning some screws and flipping some switches and see what happens. Maybe we can get this thing to come back to life today and show some signs of life. So we got a ton of work to do. Let's just get into it. 
All right, there are two things that need to happen in order for this crazy PDP-11 portable idea to actually work. And the first is that these two boards need to work. This one here is a PDP-1123 Plus CPU board. You can see it is pure dip. There's not a single PGA, BGA, or surface mount component anywhere on here. This is a very early large scale integration PDP-11 CPU board. It is the M8 one eight nine. Uh, now we call it large scale integration because the PDP 11 gubbins are pretty much all contained on this single chip right here, which we can see has a build date of 8315. So the 15th week of 1983. Now this board over here is an M8067 and this is 256k of memory. That is the maximum amount of addressable memory for an 18-bit address. Now the 1123 Plus can support up to four megabytes of memory with extended addressing and the 22-bit backplane, but we're going to stuff this into an 18-bit backplane, and uh, well, these two should work together totally fine. But essentially, we have CPU and memory, and if both of these uh, cards are working correctly, then we should be able to at least see some diagnostic stuff happening. So uh, now we just got to get to the second most critical part, which is plugging these into a backplane and giving them power. And this is what I'm going to use to accomplish that. This is an 1103AA backplane, but uh, it is a four slot backplane uh, with 18 bit addressing. So I think you can actually rewire these using the uh, wire wrap pins on the back to have 22 bit addressing, but uh, we're not gonna concern ourselves with that. We just really wanna see a functioning 1123. And I think this is gonna be perfect for it. This is also very nice and compact. It's much smaller than other PDP 11s out there, very thin and not very deep. So I am missing the actual casing that goes with this that has the uh, nice clean front cover that sits on top of it and all of that. So we're gonna have to build something custom anyways. And if we're building something custom, I think this is a perfect place to start because it also happens to include the power supply and front panel over here. The front panel is really simple. It's just three toggle switches and a couple of LEDs, but the power supply is much more complex. It's got a huge transformer here in the back of it. And uh, it's well set up for all of the correct voltage levels for the 1103 and the 1123. It's just in really rough shape. This capacitor is floating free. Some of the uh, cables have been completely smashed and they're in not great shape. So we're going to have to uh, do a lot of work to bring this thing back to life so that we can plug everything in and power it up and hopefully get the correct voltages coming into this backplane so that we can then plug our cards in and go from there. But the first step is going to be getting this thing far enough apart to start fixing the uh, awfulness that is going on inside of it. First things first, let's separate the card cage from the power supply. It's held in place with four screws that thread into the power supply frame. With these four removed, the card cage is free and clear, and it gives us a great look at the tiny little 115 volt AC cooling fans. Let's go ahead and try to free these fans from the cage to give us a little better access, and they're held in place with two bolts each. The nut on the back isn't captive, so some care has to be taken to hold it in place while you undo the screws. But with the four screws removed, the fans can pull free and the cables for them don't come loose easily enough, so they're still kind of just stuck here. Uh, anyways, let's get this big chonker of a capacitor free next. It's a tight fit, but it barely slips out, and then we can get to and remove the cables by undoing the screws from the terminals on the capacitor, which lets us get it fully out. Let's put some energy into this big boy and see what it does. And yeah, that thing is rock solid and looks to not even be leaky. That's, that's excellent. With the big pieces free, let's give this thing a clean. I like to use a paintbrush to knock dust loose and then follow up with the air hose to blow it all clear. I'll do the same thing on the back plane as well, really cleaning out the edge connectors. The backing plate was filthy too, so I soaked it in simple green and gave it a good wipe down, and it came out looking practically brand new. Anyways, time to get it all back together, starting with the big capacitor. I don't know how it was originally held in place, but I'm going to use some beefy zip ties to secure it to the frame. Next, let's get the power connections hooked up to the back plane. 
This is a nice little single unit that just slips into place and gets screwed down. I wish more manufacturers would do it like this. The cable that carried the logic and power to the front panel though has clearly seen some better days. I need to try and straighten all these pins out, being careful not to break any. I just used a small pair of needle nose pliers and really took my time. But there was one pin that was already missing when I got this unit. Unfortunately, all the pins on this connector are used, so we need to think of some way to repair this. And I'll start with isolating the wire in the ribbon cable that the pin is supposed to connect to. Then I'll slice that wire in half and strip it back so I can bodge to it. I then took a spare socket, pressed some solid core wire into the missing pin's location and soldered it in to be extra secure. Then I just pressed the broken connector into the newly modified socket. And this gives a clean socket to plug into the front panel, but also it allows me to loop my solid core wire around and solder it to the ribbon cable, making a nice clean repair. All right, I've got everything cleaned up, plugged back in, and I think we're ready to flip the power switch for the first time. Obviously there's no cards in it because if something is horribly wrong here, we don't want to destroy a card. I do have the power plugged into the backplane, but the backplane is totally passive. So there isn't a short anywhere on the backplane, so the power supply can't hurt the backplane. We should be totally fine there. Uh, what I'm expecting to happen is the two fans should spin up. They're 115 volt fans, so they should spin up regardless of what the power supply is doing. And then I'm hoping to see some LEDs here, maybe the Power OK LED. Uh, and then I don't know if the switches here will do anything, but we'll flip them to see. So let's uh, flip the big power switch on the back and see what happens. Absolutely nothing. Not a single thing. And this is why nothing happened. Should have checked the fuse first. That is extremely blown. That doesn't bode well for this power supply. But we'll put a new fuse in and uh, <laughs> give it a try. Hopefully it doesn't blow like this again. That's nasty. Before I put the fuse in, I noticed that uh, we had a wire that was disconnected. This one back here. This was behind a uh, little plate like this. But um, this wire has been intentionally unplugged. And uh, this wire just goes to one of those 115 volt cooling fans. So it's nothing vital to the power supply itself. Uh, but it's interesting that that is what is unplugged. Looks like it came from right back here. That uh, screw is loose. Um, either way, we'll put a new fuse in, power it up with the fan unplugged to see what happens. Uh, and then if it does look good, we'll plug it in and see what happens again after that. All right, new fuse in place. What we're hoping to see is one fan spin up and an LED. Uh, what we're really hoping to not see is smoke or the fuse to immediately blow again. But uh, there's only one way to find out, and that's to flip the switch and see what happens. Well, the fan spun up. Uh, something popped, though. <laughs> I did see a spark in there. That's not good. But the fan is spinning, or at least one of them is. Uh, we saw an LED briefly, and then it went away, so that probably has to do with that spark that we saw in there. Uh, that's not great. I went ahead and removed this cap that I'm holding right here. This is a 180 microfarad at uh, 50 volts. It went right there. That's kind of in the general area where I saw the spark and it, <laughs> that's gross. The traces uh, do not look great down there. The cap has very clearly leaked all over the place. So I'm going to need to clean that up and see if the traces have been obliterated by this uh, and replace the capacitor. And hopefully that'll get us going. Uh, hopefully there's nothing more serious lurking around beneath here. All right, I didn't have a 180 microfarad 50 volt capacitor, so I took two 100 microfarad uh, 50 volt capacitors and put them in parallel. That gives me 200 microfarad. That's close enough. It should work fine. So uh, I got everything plugged back in and soldered back in. So let's uh, flip the switch and see what happens. The run light flashed momentarily, but the power OK light never comes on. Uh, I didn't hear a spark. That's Good, I guess. All right, nothing is ever easy, and uh, there's a lot of things that I didn't understand about this power supply, but as I'm wrapping my head around it, I'm understanding more and more things are broken and not working like they're supposed to. The fan was totally unrelated. It's just gummed up. I need to take it out and clean it. That's why it's unplugged out of the back. 
When you flip the primary AC switch on back here, it doesn't bring up the DC to the back plane. You actually have to flip the restart button up here. Now, if I flip that restart button up here, we're gonna see something interesting on the scope. And we can see that we have this interesting square wave pattern on the scope here. So we'll go ahead and flip that off so it doesn't keep doing that. Now, this is kind of strange. I'm just reading right off of uh, this inductor right here which is L1. This is an inductor on the 12 volt rail, but the five volt rail is built pretty much identically to the 12 volt rail, but both the 12 volt and five volt rails are behaving exactly the same with this kind of strange square wave pattern going on here. And uh, the frequency of this pattern, if we look on the scope here, it says like 95 kilohertz. That's totally wrong. If we count it, we're 50 milliseconds per division. So from falling edge to rising edge is about 125 milliseconds. Then falling edge to falling edge is about 250 milliseconds. Now, if we read in the manual here about overload and short circuit protection, it says when in an overload condition, excessive power supply current is sensed, causing both switching regulators to go off and then cycle on and off at a low frequency rate, approximately 7.5 hertz until the overload is removed. So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing overload protection happening because this is uh, pretty much seven and a half hertz right there. Now, if we look at the overload diagram here on the uh, schematic, we can see that there's some interesting stuff going on and a whole lot of one-shot things going on here. Uh, but the fact that we're getting that seven and a half hertz tells me that the low frequency circuit over here is all working totally fine. Now we could have a failed current sense transistor, uh, we could have a failed diode, or we could have a failed current limit comparator, or we just could actually be pulling too much current. I'm inclined to think that we're pulling too much current because if we look at this schematic here, uh, we can see that the five volt rail has three big honking capacitors on the end of it here. And I'm fairly certain that those three are part of this group of tall capacitors right up here at the front. And uh, well, they look like the same type of capacitor that burned itself up over there. So I think the next step is to uh, get this far enough apart that I can get these capacitors out and take a look at them and uh, potentially replace them. And then we'll give it a try again. All right, four new capacitors in. For the three capacitors that went on the five volt rail, that's where these right here, these were 6.3 volts at uh, 1200 microfarad, and I had perfect replacements for these. One of them is definitely bad, this one actually, because, yeah, <laughs> it smells like fish. Uh, even though <laughs> the outward appearance of it is not bad, it looks totally fine, but it's definitely leaking something because it ranks. Uh, so that's all four of those capacitors replaced. Hopefully that's what our problem was. There may still be something more sinister going on though, but there's only one way to find out and that's to flip the switch in the back here. The fan is spun up. Nothing will happen until I hit the restart button. Exact same problem. We're still uh, cycling at seven and a half hertz. So uh, those capacitors were not the issue, although one of them was an issue. It wasn't the issue. All right, I think I'm starting to hone in on some interesting stuff here. Uh, if you can hear a little bit of droning in the background, uh, I apologize for that. I've got the mill running uh, and it's just outside that door there. It's cutting out a circuit board for UE1. Um, I'll try to talk over it. Uh, hopefully it's not too intrusive. But with uh, this monstrosity here, we've got some interesting stuff happening. So right now I've got the scope probe sitting on the five volt rail and uh, I actually have a load on uh, both the five volt and 12 volt rail. I've got a two ohm load on the 12, on the five volt and a 10 ohm load on the 12 volt. So if I flip on the AC power here and we flip the restart button here, we get this interesting uh, waveform up here. I'll take a single shot of that so we don't have to sit here and let this thing run perpetually. Uh, and this is what the five volt rail is doing. And there's a lot of really interesting information that we can glean from this. But in order to understand what that information means, we first have to understand what the power supply is doing. And that is gonna require getting a little deeper into the manual. We can think about it best as having three distinct parts that all kind of work in harmony. 
We have the regulator that takes a uh, unregulated 24 volts and regulates it down to either 12 volts or five volts. Uh, and then we have a uh, overload and short circuit protection circuit. Uh, and then we have a crowbar circuit. And the three of these are kind of all codependent on each other. Um, now the regulator itself is a little weird and hard for me to understand. I did a lot of talking with uh, MX Shift and CJ and a bunch of other people on the Discord last night, and I'm starting to kind of grasp it. Uh, essentially, we have our unregulated voltage coming into the top, and this goes through a large pass transistor. And that's actually controlled by the uh, three terminal regulator that they're pointed at down here. This is actually just a 7805. Now, what this means is that essentially after a certain amount of current is passed, uh, the 7805 uh, feedback network, network over here starts to change and allows some voltage to pass through the pass switch. Uh, and then this brings the voltage up to combat the load that's going on. However, if something goes wrong and there's some kind of unchecked problem, like maybe there's too much current or uh, the voltage gets too high, we hit the overload and short circuit protection circuit. Uh, and it's fantastically complex looking. We've got essentially a current switch. This is a 0.02 ohm resistor. Uh, and so there's... A <laughs> <laughs> like very tiny amount of voltage drop happening across that resistor. And that is turning on a current sense transistor or turning it off. And uh, d if that current sense transistor goes on, we go into a current limit comparator with a couple of one shots and uh, we do a hold off that turns off everything. It turns off the entire regulator circuit. And so that's the reason that we're getting really strange stuff showing up there. But there is one more circuit that we need to pay attention to, and that is the crowbar circuit. And it's actually pretty simple. It's over here. Um, and it's just a uh, 5.6 volt Zener diode and R19, and they create a reference of 6.1 volts. So if the voltage gets above 6.1 volts, uh, it kicks off a couple of, uh, uh, I think, SCRs, thyristors, maybe? Essentially, these are like thyrotrons. The vacuum tube equivalent is a thyrotron, <laughs> whatever the silicon version of a thyrotron is. Uh, but it kicks those off. They start conducting, and they pull that 5-volt rail to ground. Now, I think that is exactly what we're seeing happen here. So this is the five volt circuit. We see a large jump up to about five and a half volts, but then we see a steady ramp up. That should not be happening. So as this voltage ramps up, it ramps up to above six volts, up to about six and a half volts. This kicks off the crowbar circuit. They start to conduct and they pull that five volt rail to ground. Now, when that happens, there's going to be a phenomenal amount of current flowing from the five volt rail to ground. And that is enough current to uh, trip the current sense resistor over here. And that kicks off all these one shots that then shuts the whole thing down until it resets and tries again. Very cool way of doing this deck. I actually really like this kind of power supply design. It's very, very interesting. But uh, that means what's going wrong? Why is all of this going so poorly for us? Uh, well, we need to take a look back at the basic regulator circuit here. So I think our fault is pretty much right among these uh, three resistors and three transistors right down here. But I think the first goal is to essentially eliminate the driver transistor from the circuit. This doesn't have an effect on anything else except for the pass switch. If we remove the driver transistor, the pass switch should never turn on and nothing else should overload or break. And if we still have a runaway voltage problem with the driver transistor removed, that tells us that the pass switch has failed. If we don't have a problem anymore, that means that potentially the driver transistor is bad or we have a problem down in the control section. So uh, I got a lot of work to do to try and figure out where those are. Uh, and then, well, just gotta keep plugging away at it, I guess. Okay, I've got the uh, power supply quite far apart here. I removed one fan. That's the one that was all gummed up over here. I removed it completely. You can see it's 
gross. That needs cleaning separately, so we're just gonna leave it out for now. But that also gave me access to this little transistor right here. Uh, this is the driver transistor, and with it removed, the pass switch or the pass transistor up there should never turn on because R16 to ground is still in place. The result of this means that the 7805 should be doing all of the regulation, and since there's no load on it, that should be totally fine. So what we wanna see on the scope here is uh, five volts come up and stay up without the overprotection circuit hitting. If the overprotection circuit hits, we could still have trouble in the 12 volts uh, side or we could have trouble with the pass transistor. So <laughs> let's give it a shot. We'll flip the power switch on in the back here. Helps if I plug it in. All right, now we'll flip the uh, power switch on the back here. The fan spun up. Then we'll flip the main power switch here. Yeah, I can still hear it kicking off. It's interesting that the five volt, interesting. So the five volt isn't kicking off. It goes up to about, uh, four and a half volts and then we have a large spike when the uh, uh, over protection over voltage protection circuit kicks in that could be the 12 volt section uh, bothering us so um, maybe we might need to remove the transistor for the uh, 12 volt section as well it could be that both the past transistors on the 5 volt and 12 volt section died uh, I don't know that <laughs> oh that's really interesting <laughs> All right, I, th I think I've hit a bit of a roadblock um, this thing man for such a small package it is absolutely ruthless taking no prisoners <laughs> it's it's winning this fight um uh, so i initially started by removing uh q3 this is the driver transistor on the five volt side and that got the five volt side to start behaving some it wasn't over volting anymore it didn't seem but the uh, overcurrent protection was still kicking off, which means the 12 volt side was misbehaving. So I moved over to the 12 volt side and removed the same transistor, only it's uh, labeled Q18 on this schematic here. And the 10 ohm resistor R74 turned into a light emitting resistor. It, <laughs> it let the magic smoke out. And that is curious. But I removed that 10 ohm resistor, which means that the 7812 should be completely off and the pass transistor shouldn't be passing anything because the driver transistor is removed. And I was still seeing 13 volts on the 12 volt rail. That doesn't make any sense. Nothing should be putting voltage on the 12 volt rail. It should be dead. Uh, so I removed the pass transistor. That's this uh, big chonker over here and still 13 volts on the 12 volt rail. Usually you're trying to get a power supply to work, not to not work, but I can't get this one to not work. I'm trying to kill the 12 volt power supply. So looking at the schematic, there is absolutely nothing that could be putting voltage onto the 12 volt rail. Uh, but I think Q15 is the only place that could be putting voltage into the 7812, and the 7812 is the only thing that could be putting voltage onto the uh, 12 volt rail. So we started thinking that maybe that uh, Q15 had quite a lot of leakage between the uh, base and emitter. So we removed Q15 and finally, the 12 volt rail is dead. And that is the state that we're in right now. So that tells me that we're gonna need to replace this transistor, but this is a D44C9 and uh, I don't have any replacement ones of these. As a matter of fact, I don't have any replacement transistors at all. All I've got are about 5,000 vacuum tubes and that doesn't help any at all right here. <laughs> so I'm gonna need to order some parts. That's gonna take some time. So we're gonna wrap it up here on this one. I hate leaving a project unfinished, but well, nothing to it. <laughs> we just gotta wait for new parts to arrive. We got so less far than I thought we would in this episode. <laughs> I was really thinking it would just power up, we'd plug it in, we'd go into ODDT, and we would say, yay, the 1123 works. We never even got to having a good voltage coming out. So uh, I apologize <laughs> if you were hoping for some serious progress. Instead, I hope you maybe learned some interesting things about the way that DEC built power supplies today. We're gonna come right back to this project uh, as soon as the parts get in and get that voltage up because I really wanna see that 1123 
3 CPU board boot. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next episode.